Alright. We're back. Episode 2. For some maps. Uh, today, I'm going to write this list down so that we don't forget everything. Uh, today, we're going to keep talking about Crow. Um, and I want to touch on a few specific things. i um, going to start with... Just a quick run through of some I2C stuff, um, or using the II protocol. Um, we're gonna talk. We're gonna make just friend. Uh, Crow talk to just friends. Um, there, there's a new just friends firmware which I'll put up after this. Um, it does next to nothing extra except uh, extends all the I2C behavior and lets you do a few fancy things. Um, that haven't been possible until now. Um, it won't be fully spotted by Crow until the next update, but um, I'll get the, the beta firmware up. Um, but we'll talk about controlling Just Friends. We'll talk about querying values from Just Friends. Um, and then hopefully get into some kind of interesting polyphonic sequencing. Um, and I think that's particularly interesting with a... Um, with a text-based, um, a text-based language rather than like a regular sequencer or using a piano roll, um, kind of lets you gives you a different perspective on um, what sequencing is and like how you can think about um, sequencing, especially like within the context of chords and like uh, note clusters. Um, so we'll touch on that. I think that'll. Uh, That'll take us through the first hour. Hopefully we'll make some kind of nice uh, kind of fragmenting uh, kaleidoscopic chord sequences. That's kind of the vibe, the goal at least. Um, and then in the second hour, let's write that down, kaleidoscopic <laughs> uh, note sequences, chord sequences, even better. Uh, and in the second hour, I'm going to get into this idea I've been, I've been thinking about, which is um, having a, a timeline-oriented uh, sequencer. Um, I'm going to write that, I'm going to write up a really brief uh, example of that right now. So, um, this is the... Timeline sequencer. I was also thinking of it as a kind of um, function tracker, which might make sense when you see it. Uh, it looks something like we have a table. Uh, it's going to be a table. Of a table of events that looks something like this. Um, So that kind of, this kind of idea um, of basically having a, a table that represents time and an action like this. Um, yeah, so we're going to use some metros. We're going to um, kind of show some fancy Lua stuff uh, about how to kind of make that kind of thing possible. Because I would love to have this. Um, this style of writing functions. Eventually, I want to change these the timestamps to be something, things like this, like for for bars and beats. Um, but that's probably beyond the scope of what we can do in an hour. But um, 
that's coming that's coming soon so it, i mean it's just like stuff i'm working on it's all possible already um it's just you just have to write it so i guess i'm kind of trying to express some of these interesting ideas that can kind of be pursued um hopefully beyond just in inside my computer in my brain um this computer <laughs> Uh, okay, so timeline sequencer. Um, number is duration here. Indeed it is. Time elapsed. Uh, yeah, you could do it either way. Uh, the goal of what I want to do with this is to have, as opposed to ASL, which is about um, duration per step, this is going to be about timestamps in absolute time from some arbitrary beginning. But this is later. We'll get back to that. Um... Okay, so yes, everything everything today is gonna to be about crow again. Um, I promise we'll we'll move on beyond crow at some point, but uh, today um, today is another like set of crow adventures. So hopefully that's not too upsetting for everybody tuned in. Um, yeah, we'll one day we'll talk about all the cold max and what's possible. Maybe I'll, I'll see if I can find some more. <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay, um, I2C, just friends. <coughs> the easiest thing, uh, we can do is we're just going to, all these cables don't really matter, um, but we're just going to listen to the output, uh, let's just low pass it, we're going to listen to the output of this just friends right here. Um, I'm gonna put it into. Oh, we we can start here. Um, okay. Uh, let's make sure that everything's working. I just uh, I just flashed the new firmware in here because this module was not working before. So hopefully there's nothing more uh, serious wrong with it. Ooh, lines are loaded. This shouldn't happen. This probably means something is messed up. Are these still all running? Maybe they froze. Oh, did that do it? Oh, it did. Okay. There you go. For some reason, we didn't have the pull-ups on. All right. So, um, with Just Friends, uh, it has it has this synthesis mode um, that is available to access only via I two C. Um, I'd love for it to be available on the on the panel, but there's just not enough CV jacks and stuff to do it. So, um, you you turn it on basically by running this I I I I is everything talking about I two C on Crow, um, then JF is the, is short for just friends. Um, that's going to be the, the abbreviation we use. Um, and then we say mode, which is obviously a very generic name, but this is specifically talking about, um, the synthesis mode. It also does geode mode, which is a kind of complex, um, polyrhythmic modulation generator, but, uh, I'm not going to touch on that today, mostly because I don't know it that well. Um, and I haven't explored it that far. It's a little, it's a little more complex. So we're just going to stick with the synthesizer stuff today, and hopefully, that will get us to somewhere interesting. Um, so, if I execute this, you'll note that all the lights on here turned off, um, and that's a good sign. Uh, that says that things are actually working. And we're we're currently in. Oh, we were in geode mode, but now like with with in in sound mode, um, that means. It should be in synthesizer mode. And you'll see the lights are, are pulsating. I, I don't know if you can see that. Um, but in cycle mode, basically the envelopes are going to be running all the time and they're going to spit out whatever node is, gen is, is set to that channel. So if we... If we're doing low... See how we go with this. Let me know how the level is, everybody. 
Um, but you'll see right now it's just, it's basically on a cycle, it's triggering each note. Um, and the, the, the timing of this, basically when you put, when you go into synthesis mode on Just Friends, um, the time and intone controls uh, stop controlling the frequency of the oscillators and instead control an envelope shape. Um, so the time control, um, it's like you're in Just Friends shape mode. So as you turn it down, the envelope gets longer and longer. So obviously it's very long right now. But you can also go quite fast. Um, the intone control changes from um, a shorter attack and long, re uh, long release, but because it's a, it's a Vactrol simulation, so it's quite uh, it's quite limited in terms of what you can do, but I think what you can do is really nice. Um, so we have these like nice pings, like when it's fully uh, counterclockwise, that's like basically a Vactrol emulation. Um, but you can turn intern up to get these kind of swoopy bird sounds. And when you go uh, clockwise, it, it turns into like almost just like a gate on off with like a, a slew up and a slew down. So we'll leave it in like plucky, uh, plucky mode. Uh, I'm going to switch it to transient mode now. So um, the pitches are still saying the same, but um, we now have to send it a message in order to turn on that envelope. Um, we can do that now. Oh, there's a new... I should... Let me um, bring up the documentation, or at least the... Ooh, even better. Let's just look at the... Source? Does that make it wor worse or better? We'll see. <laughs> um, so this is like the, the description of all the different commands that are available. Um, I think I'm just looking for one specific one. It'll be down. Oh. Oh. Okay. This is a. We don't currently have all of the Just Friends functionality on here because it's the wrong firmware on Crow, but uh, we don't need it. We can just uh, we can just move with what we've got. So we'll try the first one. We're going to play a note. Um, we're going to give it a voltage as a pitch in the same way that we talk to the outputs of Crow uh, in terms of volt per octave. So zero is going to be a default center pitch, which I believe is A440. Um, this can be positive or negative, uh, up to 10, 10 octaves in either direction. Uh, so you've got plenty of room to play with. And then we give an amplitude, and this is again in volts. So if we say a five volt amplitude, that should, uh, that should get us what we want. Um, we need to uh, play voice here actually, because I wanna show this first. Um, so this number one at the beginning is which channel? So, there we go. We have a, a lovely note. We can change our pitch. Uh, it's being low pass filtered. But obviously, we can go. We can go right down. Subsonic. You probably. I don't even know if that comes through. Um, so we have these sounds. Um, that's the most, this is the kind of most direct and basic way of talking to Just Friends. Um, at the moment, we're speaking to channel one in particular. Um, this means we can sequence channel one with these messages uh, in isolation. So it's like a, a single voice oscillator. Uh, what we can also do is we can dynamically allocate um, notes across all six channels. Um, so right now, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but it's just tracked over the last channels, and this one now it's back at number one. So we get our note. Uh, if we listen instead to the mix output, we're going to hear all of these. Um, we're going to hear them all. The cool thing we can do is if we turn up, if we like slow down the envelope so it has a longer sustain, um, we, they can overlap each other. So you'll probably hear some like phasing as they overlap. It doesn't make so much sense with the same note. Um, 
but what we could do uh, is something kind of to use a little bit of Lua. Um, we're just going to do a simple for loop, and let's just do two channels. Um, we're going to say ii.jf.playNote, um, and we want to play the value of n, which is going to be either 1 or 2, because of our loop numbers, and then we're going to give it a, a voltage of 5. Um, so that should give us two notes that are an octave apart. So it sounds like additive synthesis, right? Um, because it's kind of what happens when you do um, digital oscillators overlap like that. So that's kind of taking them both, shifting them down by an octave. Um, what we could do instead is we can obviously do some more interesting maths on this. So we multiply it by three, so we get three and six. Um, and I want to basically turn that into a minor third. So I'm going to take that value and divide it by 12. So that's going to be 3 and 6 divided by 12 becomes 3 twelfths and 6 twelfths. So it's a equally tempted minor third. Um, but so we can do stuff like that where it's programmatic, um, kind of to get multiple notes. and you'll see they like overlap each other in a pretty interesting way. You also have control of uh, the timbre here, so. So you kind of get some nice kind of movement. Obviously, modulating this stuff is going to be a really nice thing to do. We could even set that up now with, uh, with this just friends. I'm just using this as a LFO, just because it's handy. It's nice, it's a bit intense. Let's just uh, we'll smooth it out a little bit. Again, this is huge overkill, but I'm going to use a uh, cold Mac to attenuate that. I think this will get more interesting once we get some sounds going. Yeah, all right. Um, can you do a while loop in the REPL? You could, but it would probably run forever. Um, okay, so this is kind of some kind of basic introduction stuff, but let's, let's write a script. Um, I've definitely written some of this stuff before. Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I need to look at this list. What do we have here? Not able to type well today for some reason. Yeah, this is it. You're gonna have to look past um, a bunch of things that you're seeing right now and pretend that you didn't see them, please. All right, are we good? I'm gonna resave this as. Um, just friends seek. Cool. <laughs> Cali dreaming. It's actually, it's a calibration setup. It's not anything exciting. Um, so let's try that. Does this even, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm going, jumping way ahead here. I shouldn't do that. I really just wanted to look at this and we'll, we'll, we'll cut it from scratch. Let's do that. Um, right. Great. Okay, so some of this is going to touch on what we did last week, um, but I think it'll be fun either way. I really like this color scheme. Okay, so we're going to start with an init script, um, and this is a just 
friends poly sequencer. Um, what I'm gonna start, what I'm gonna try and do basically is define a scale. Um, we're gonna start with one scale, maybe extend it to um, to numerous ones after we begin, um, and then we're just gonna use that scale and kind of like pull multiple notes out of it at once um, on a on a timer. Um, that's kind of so it'll be like a yeah a sequencer that kind of like dynamically grabs notes out of a scale. Um, so to start that, I want to write um, our scale. Let's. Um, it's probably a little bit boring to do them this way all the time, but I I am just a. I don't know. I'm a sucker for this particular scale. Um, so it's like a Lydian, major Lydian, something like that. Um, where to begin? So what, what we eventually need to do is call ii.jf.playNote. And we're going to need a note, and we're going to give it a, let's give it a default uh, volume of five volts. We'll just say that's fine for now. Um, the nice thing here is like when you start sequencing multiple voices at once, um, it can very easily clip the output of the mix jack because you know adding six 10 volt peak to peak waveforms together um, you very quickly clip on your 24 volt rails you've got, you've got less than half the required um, headroom um, so sometimes we're gonna, we might need to turn this down even to like two volts or something like that once we get all six voices going at once um, so this is going to be our, um, our main function that we're going to call to play notes. Um, and what we want to do is we want to take our scale, we want to grab some index, and then we're going to divide it by 12 because we want um, 12 notes in an octave. And we've, we've listed these as like um, 12 fractions of one. So rather than having to divide each one of these by 12, uh, we instead just do it once at the end. Um, so we need to figure out what our index is going to be. So this, um, let's say, um, let's call it S6. <laughs> 6, that doesn't work. Um, scale, scale X. All right, cool. And we're going to start with the number one. Oh, that's a nice, easy place to start. And we want to change every time. We're going to like cycle each time. So after we use that index, I'm going to update that value to be itself, modulo the length of our scale, and then we're going to add one. And this is a this is a little trick in Lua, um, which is that because everything's one based, if you modulo it, if you if you have a, a an index number or a, some kind of um, some item selector that starts at one and counts up to some number. If you modulo it by the by the length, it actually kind of takes that top number and puts it down at zero. Um, and zero is not a valid index in Lua, so we just add one to the thing. And basically what it's done is it's kind of cycled everything one step at a time. Um, that's a nice way to do it. Uh, it's kind of takes a while. It's, it's a little different thinking in um, one based number systems rather than zero like a lot of other languages but that should do it um, so each time we call these two lines um, it should cycle uh, which is happening so let's wrap it in a function um, and we need to give it a name so let's say let's just call it n sometimes it's I know this is not descriptive, but sometimes it's nice because in the REPL you can just type one letter and, and put parens around it, and I find that really can help speed things up. Um, we're just going to call it once in the init function. Um, I don't know, why don't we call it a few times? Well, let's, we'll start here. Okay, so uh, we're going to run Valerie um, JFS. So we have one note, that's all we got. Um, but now we can play the next note in our scale and the next. And we get this kind of nice uh, experience. 
of like climbing up the scale but you'll see how like just friends kind of like holds under the decays of the previous notes and that's because it's like dynamically cycling through the different voices um we can play two notes at once by just calling the function twice so that's the one and the major seven um and this is nice but maybe it's a little bit uh it's tough because the notes are right next to each other. I, I think it sounds pretty, but... And because what we're doing is we're taking two notes at a time, but we have a seven note scale, each time we play through we have like a different set matching together. So it's a sequence of 14 uh, dyads, is that what they're called? Um, mid-century modular. No, R, R is, is something built into Druid that runs the script. Um, so you give it a file name. That's what I was doing before. Um, like that. So you pass it the file name and it uploads it. Um, so you have that like lovely like rising sequence, um, which I think sounds really nice. So why don't we, why don't we just start there? We'll, uh, let's put it inside a metro just to um, get it moving. In order to do that, I'm going to reference uh, this because I forget how to do it all the time. Event time. Oh, we can just index, right? So I'm just going to use a number, uh, an indexed metro. Um, this, this is kind of like the most, the, the quickest way to use them. Um, you just kind of say, you, I think there's, um, seven metros available, maybe eight. Um, so you can use numbers up to eight to run simultaneous metronomes. Um, and we're basically going to assign the function, uh, the event to be the function n. Um, so every time the metro runs, it's going to call this function down here. Um, we don't need to call it here yet. Um, we can set our time to be, let's uh, 0.4, sure. Um, and then we'll start it. So this is a method call there, this, uh, that colon. That basically, uh, we have to say metro one. So it says like, take the metro one and then tell it to do this kind of thing that it knows how to do, which is start. So did we save that? I hope so. Okay, so this is just one note. So we want to run it twice, right? So there's a number of ways we can do that. Um, weird ways. Let's let's wrap it down here. Also change that behavior so we can say and I'm gonna, I'm gonna change this line um, so what if we want to we want to uh, cycle in thirds um, we'll do that by adding two rather than uh, just one so we'll add two um, then modular that with our scale
and this is interesting, it sounds like it's descending, and that's because the two notes are moving up, but they're kind of, it's aliasing basically through the scale to give that effect of uh, descending. which will probably sound ascending again. And you'll note how I'm, I'm continuing to upload the same script again and again. Um, and each time I do it, uh, Just Friends keeps running. You know, just, just Friends is just listening to these messages. It doesn't mind. Like, when we run a new script on Crow, Crow is restarting. It's like completely closing everything down, rebooting, rerunning the initialization script. Um, but Just Friends doesn't stop. It just kind of keeps going, and this allows you to do some interesting things. And it also makes the, uh, the experimentation process of writing a script, like, very... Uh, it feels very kind of natural in a way. It feels, like, uh, smooth. You know, you're not kind of constantly worried about... Um, the big glitches, like oftentimes when you're using the CV directly, sometimes it can be frustrating that it zips to a different value very briefly. But um, this is really, really nice, I find. Um, One thing I'll call out very briefly is, um, you'll note in Druid, right here, it tells us, running just friends poly sequencer. Um, and the reason it knows that is because of the name all the way over there. Um, this at the top. If you start your script, um, just add a, add a comment. Add a comment that gives it a name or just gives you some kind of information about it so that if you share that script somebody will will see this appear in their druid um, i can't i can't highlight but uh, it'll show up it'll say oh i'm running the script so it's kind of a little less a little less opaque um for people as they're kind of using your scripts okay so this is kind of a nice set of sounds what if we want to make it I uh, have multiple scales though. I'm just going to get my, uh, my timing device, aka my phone. Alright, we're good. Ooh, one thing we haven't touched on is... is frequency modulation. So one of the cool things about... Uh, One of the cool things about Just Friends is that when you put it into synthesis mode, it's not just a subtractive voice. Um, so at the moment, that's all it sounds like. It's just a, a plain, like each voice is just a plain oscillator and kind of have, you have continuous control over the waveform with the, the ramp and curve controls. Uh, so at 12 o'clock, it's, it's triangle waves. If you turn curve all the way up, you just have a, a set of sine waves um, and you can skew them. So you get like, you can control uh, even harmonics, I don't know, whichever one it is that makes it sound like a, a sawtooth, like really big and brassy uh, with ramp. Or if you go the other direction, it becomes a, a square wave with PWM. in sine wave mode to show you this next thing, which is when you turn the FM control, um, it starts introducing frequency modulation, and that's linked to every voice. So each voice has 
two oscillators. One is the one you're hearing, and another is a modulation oscillator to do two voice, uh, two operator FM synthesis. So if I turn the FM control all the way clockwise, um, you get this like, it sounds like a wave folding, and that's because the two oscillators are tuned precisely to be the same value. Um, Counterclockwise is the same thing, but it's interesting because each voice is given a different amount of FM modulation. So the the identity output, the first output, um, has no modulation, and the, the 6M has six, well, it has five times some base value, and channel two has one times that base value. Um, which I think is interesting when you, uh, it's interesting like this because you get this kind of cycling nature to it. Um, but also, uh, oh, actually, I think it might be more obvious when we. Um, if we just have one note playing. Oh, I can just do this. So as we cycle through different notes, there's like a, every six notes has a different amount of FM modulation. Um, but because we have a seven note scale, that's gonna phase which note that lands on. Um, which I think is kind of an interesting, interesting thing. If we turn this up to be, oh, we can skip here. We make this substantially faster, um, we might get some interesting, uh, kind of arpeggiator effects. It has this effect of moving which note is being emphasized by the FM. At least to my ears. One thing we, we, we one thing we can do is uh, we can change the ratio of the modulation to the carrier. So we can do that again with, with I2C. Um, ooh, one thing we can do. So I've just added a parameter so that I can dynamically change the volume of just friends. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is we can query all the things that we can tell just friends to do. I should have thought of this before rather than trying to look at documentation. We can just say ii.jf.help and call that as a function. And it'll give me a list of everything that I everything that I can send it. So this is all stored inside of Pro. Um, so you can always query that if you're a little bit uncertain. Um, so I want to use run mode, and I'm going to tell it the value 1. And what this is going to do is it's going to pretend that there's a, a cable plugged into the run jack on Just Friends. I think this is necessary. It might not be. But it shouldn't do anything, because 0 volts into the, into the jack keeps the modulation frequencies locked together. Um, but what this means is I can now say run, and I can give it a voltage value. And I believe that plus 5 volts is mapped to a multiplication of 2, and negative 5 volts is mapped to a division by 2. So this should give us like a, an octave up effect with an FM kind of sound. And we get like a, a totally different timbre. Um, and it's quite sensitive to the waveform with the curve control. I don't know, it has like a magical kind of 
twin face on there, I really like. One thing I'll say is the ramp control will get you into detuned territory very, very quickly. Which is really nice if it's a little bit off, because it'll give you a natural uh, vibrato to the notes. Um, but the reason for that is basically the way that Just Friends calculates its, its waveforms um, interacts with the FM calculation in a way that doesn't maintain the fundamental properly. Um, but rather than fix that, um, we kind of left it in as like a nice way to like have a, a grab onto like atonality. Norgaborg, is the modulator frequency locked when you play a note? Um, it's not, no. Uh, so basically it'll follow whatever the frequency of the channel is indefinitely. It's always calculated on the fly to match. Um, so if you had a really long decay, we can send a, an ii.jf.transpose, and that'll shift both the modulator and carrier together. Um, one, in the new firmware for Just Friends, there's also an ability to change a note as it's playing without re-triggering its envelope. Um, we'll get back there uh, at some point. Um, but for now, that's this is where we're at. Um, so that's one we can we can also pull it down an octave. And this is nice. You hear like. The cycling uh, note with no FM applied. And it, when you have this like uh, this octave down modulator, um, it has the effect that it's actually higher in pitch than everything else, even though it has no modulation applied. Um, we can do other stuff though, we can go to in between values. And I don't know, I'm sure there's magic numbers here somewhere. Um, I'm trying to think of where the fifth will be. Ooh. So there must be some kind of Right, there's a scaling to this. So, around zero volts um, is like a, it's like, it's like pretty much a, a flat curve and then like drastically curves out. And that's to make it really easy to dial in that like unison. Um, but there is absolutely numbers here. And there's, if somebody wants to find what they are, to get some nice ratios between the tones. But um, now it's not the time. Okay, we have 10 minutes before I want to move on. Zelda mode, absolutely. Uh, irrational numbers, yeah, of course you can. Um, they look, they would be the same as this, you, you can, but you can do something like that. The issue is, um, I don't know what the number is, and there's no relationship. Yeah. Well, maybe this is not working. Ooh. Oh, I turned this down. But these are not going to be just inter intonation ratios or anything, they're just generic, uh, they're just kind of arbitrary numbers. Um, okay, so let's slow this back down again.
much more peaceful. <laughs> um, before we finish on the Just Friends and ITC stuff, um, I'm just going to add in... So at the moment we have one scale. So let's rename this. Lydian. Uh, and let's do a Dorian scale. For, or we'll do something different. We'll do like a, a different numbered uh, scale. We could do a pentatonic. Another favorite. Um, what's that like this? Does anybody want to correct that? Um, but I'm going to put it Oh no, we can shift it afterwards. Okay, so um, uh, no, you can't change metro timing with a slew. You could do it programmatically though. You could use another metro uh, to gradually decrease it in steps. Um, so we'll have two scales, and then let's make a uh, a new table which contains Lydian and pentatonic. So we're basically creating this table to wrap the two tables above it. Um, and let, we should do it this way. So we're now going to need one to kind of, uh, a new variable to track which scale. Um, so let's just call that choice. So it's a dumb name, but we'll just roll with it. So we'll start at number one. And what I want to do now is hmm. rather than have a table of these numbers that would be good if we want to cycle through what i want to do is i want to basically be able to choose which scale from the uh REPL. from from druid that is um so let's instead say let's just call it scale and we're going to start with Lydian. Um, and so what that means now is down here, we're just going to use as our value scale, and we're going to index into scale. The cool thing here is scale is just kind of aliasing one of these scales to choose from. Um, the difficulty is that we're going to need to move our scale index selector um, before we call the node. And the reason for that is that um, because our scales could be different lengths, and in this case they are, um, if our number was too big, we wouldn't, um, and we change the scale between steps, we wouldn't be able to, um, to make sure it was going to be in range. So instead we're going to move it just before the play note, um, which, I, which shouldn't really change how it feels, it's just a little different way to think about it. Um, and instead of using, instead of wrapping based on our scale, we're just going to use scale. I guess I could have left that name, but here we are. Um, let's try and run that, see what happens. Uh, I don't know where that is. JS. changing its own time. I like that. Ooh, we can actually throw that in really quickly. Yeah, we got five minutes. So this is playing currently. One, what I can do now is I can set my scale to be equal to pentatonic. Can anybody guess what's happened here? Oh, okay, yes. The way we're cycling through this, we're adding four no four values to each index. Um, and so as a result, um, it's jumping through perfectly the whole set. <laughs> so let's just change this to three and that should do it. And now let's try and change the pentatonic.
And this is nice, but what if we want to we want something to be in a different key. I'm just going to add two to each of these values. You can do it programmatically, but um, I feel like this might be just as easy. And this, if you look at these numbers here, um, interestingly, the pentatonic shifted up by two notes only contain scale, uh, notes from the Lydian scale. And so between pentatonic and the pentatonic plus two semitones, we actually can create a Lydian scale. So why don't we do something with that? Um, that's, a, that's a nice little realization. Okay, uh, and what I'm going to do is bring in a second voice here, um, and we're going to do it with a mangrove. Um, and what it's going to do is basically follow the exact same notes, hopefully. We'll try and get it in tune. I feel like it's very difficult to tune them uh, when you have a static pitch. So let's send a voltage out of here. Um, and I'm just going to basically extend this line. So this is just saying play a note on Just Friends. Let's make it play a note on Mangrove as well. So, um, output one is our pitch. So we'll say volts equals, basically we're going to send it this same thing. So let's make that a variable. Uh, we'll call it note. And now we just get to substitute.
maybe what we should do is we're going to use the second one instead. We're going to say... Oh, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to do too many things at once. Um, but that's fine. My goal is to make them kind of cycle on different scales. I'm just going to hard code this out because I feel like we've waited long enough. Something like that. Is it in 7 8? I can't tell. Maybe it was at some point. Okay. Two slightly different metros. Yeah, let's do it quickly, and I'm also gonna do the thing with uh, the self decrementing metro time. So we can do that out here. Let's say. Metro on time equals. Uh, let's let's make a temporary variable first. Um, divided by two, and then we're gonna say if uh, the time is less than or equal to 0 0.01, we don't want it to go too fast, or we want to have it cycle. So then we're gonna set it to be two seconds. I think that when you change the metro time, it resets the metro, so it triggers instantly. That's, I think it's a bug. Um, 
but it's a nice idea and it's probably something we should fix. Um, but whoever asked for slightly different metros, then we can absolutely do that. Um, and then we're going to move on. So I'm just doing this brute force. This is going to be M2. And I'm just going to delete all the stuff that was about just friends in here. Uh, and then M is going to be only the stuff for just friends. No voltages. Now up here. And again, I'm just going to copy the whole thing. And I'm going to make these number two. It's going to be M2 and then let's say 2.21. skip over the other sequence. Um, so let's start there. Ooh, we got a weird error. Oh, it's because I'm doing it twice. Absolutely. Uh, it might be because I'm trying to send too many things at once. I don't even know. I like it though. Let's make this count up a little bit higher. Oh, okay, that was boring. Bad argument. I really don't see a problem here. Anyway, let's leave it for there. Leave it for there. Leave it there for now. Simply because I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna save this. So we'll, uh, I'll put that up online if anybody wants to check out this script afterwards. Um, all right, give me one sec and we'll uh,
time it restarts.
Okay. Oh, let me just read this. Also, what's up, what's up? So, uh, Zunaito, it's clear, either way, um, yeah, basically the way Lua works, so this is in terms of when you, when you run a script, what happens, um, the first thing is everything in the script gets executed, um, but what that means typically, um, when you execute this chunk of code, um, you don't actually call in it. What you're doing is is taking what you've typed and giving it to the Lua virtual machine, and it says, oh, cool, you've given me a function definition. And so what Lua does is it basically says, okay, the word init now is associated with this action that you've described. But it doesn't actually call action in the same way that um, none of these functions do anything when we run the script. All it does is it, is it tells Crow that we now have this new functionality that the user can call whenever they want. The special thing about init is that after the script is loaded, um, it's almost as if there is a call to init at the end of a script. Um, and and that's, that's behind the scenes. So that there's probably, I think there's a few other things that happen like in this gap here between the script being loaded in and init being called. Um, but you can just think of it like that. Like think of it like your program shouldn't really do anything when you execute it apart from kind of describe all the functions and the tables and values and variables you want to use. Um, and init is basically going to be called after all of that um, to kind of kickstart the whole process. That's the idea. Okay, so... Um, MSA HP. Yeah, I guess you could say that play voice is more powerful than allocated mode. Um, in, in for the just friend synth mode, the difference is that it, it takes more management. Um, and play voice is nice if you want to use all six voices as a polysynth. Um, it just makes everything simpler. You don't have to worry about dynamic allocation. Uh, that's all taken care of on the just friends level. Um, and it'll also handle, so at the moment we're running in transient mode, um, which means that each note will be dynamically allocated to a new voice, each note on. And there's no note off context, like in the MIDI, see, in the MIDI context. Um, but if you use sustain mode, um, all it, not like basically only our attacks would have registered and all the voices would be oscillating at their full volume. Um, because you have to add two, two commands to do sustain mode. So you have one to attack and then another to release. And so that means you can do sustains, uh, which I think is nice. Um, we could, you could use metros, for example, to kind of dynamically change duration of notes. Um, which obviously has a different sound to changing the envelope length. Um, or um, if you controlled it from a nonce or from a computer, like through a max patch, um, you could do full sustain management. And the cool thing about play note for Just Friends is that it will match your note releases to any playing voices at that pitch. Um, so in that context, it's much, much easier to use um, play note. Whereas doing play voice, you have to individually match like incoming messages to know which voice to assign that release to. It becomes a bit more complicated, um, but that's, that's where that's at. Okay, so um, let's talk about the timeline sequencer. It's 23 past the hour, but we'll make something happen. Um, 
I'm just leaving this music playing until we actually make a new sound, so let's see. Um, so... This is obviously inspired by um, the long fabled timeline mode from, from Teletype. Um, I don't know if this does exactly that thing, but um, we're gonna try it out. Um, so I've made a kind of arbitrary set of functions here. Um, so F1, F2, F3, and F4. Um, currently we're only calling three of them, so let's add the third. Um, and so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna try and write a library of sorts. Um, and what we're gonna try and do is allow this description to dynamically trigger these these associated functions. Oh, that should be F5. Um, we're gonna try and trigger these associated functions at the timestamp on the left column. I'm not entirely sure how it's gonna how we're gonna do it, but this is the goal. Um, so let's start by um, not um no, that should be right i'm just trying to figure out why it uh why it didn't tell me the name of the script that's running okay so something's gone wrong here um bowery slash timeline dot blue that looks correct um Maybe he doesn't like this. Okay, there we go. I think it didn't like the way I was breaking up the table with a comment in the middle. Um, so where do we start? Okay, so we have, we have our functions and I'm just gonna kind of show you what they do. Um, This is going to need, let's go out here. Okay, so note number four doesn't do anything. And this is interesting. It's only going to affect sustained notes. And it's going to it's going to work basically in tandem with F two. So so you, basically, you'll hear what's happening there. Like these these functions, these here aren't necessarily like a note. You know, it's not a it's not just a note sequencer. It's a function sequencer. So you can basically do anything you want that you can wrap in a function, which is more or less everything in Lua. So um, these functions, at the moment, this function 1 plays a note, it just plays A440. Function 2, uh, first thing it does is it changes the run mode, uh, or the run voltage, so it's going to give us like an octave down effect from an, in, in the FM perspective. Um, play note is going to play the major third of an octave, a little bit quieter, and it's also going to set uh, output 3 to be 0 volts, but down here in the init script, we set the slew time of output 3 to 2 seconds. So this function is basically going to take 2 seconds to complete its action, but that doesn't mean we can't do other things in the meantime. Um, F3 is going to play the fifth of the scale, right? Um, and F4 is going to change the run back to zero volts. Um, so that's going to get us back to like a unison, which has like a bit of a wave foldy sound. Um, and it's going to set um, this output three to be five volts. And that cable is here. It's, it's basically controlling the frequency modulation of systems or the frequency cutoff of systems. Um, it's just kind of sweeping up and down. I'll turn the resonance down a bit. Um, so those are our functions. Um, I'm just going to... Oh, where? Oh, my God. 
losing track of where my <laughs> uh, cursor is. So we also want to set down here that we're going to be in JF mode one, and we want to go run mode one too. So that'll allow us to control the run mode synthesis stuff. Um, oh yeah, Snorgaborg, thank you. Yeah, so these are similar to the teletype scripts. They're, um, but they, on top of like these direct actions, we, these could also call other functions. So um, you could also like execute ASLs or like step through an ASL, all kind of interesting stuff there. But um, how do we make this work? Uh, it's a good question, I don't know. Let's figure it out. So um, I might, maybe down the bottom here, I'm gonna say timeline underscore start. If this is any good, we can turn it into a library and that'll give us like cool things where we could um, use like dot syntax and uh, make it feel more like a timeline is like an object. But for now, it's just gonna be like part of our script. Um, it's gonna be a set of functions. So let's grab this function, this timeline start, and let's think about what it should do. Um, so the first thing I'm thinking about is we, it's gonna, we're gonna need to have a metronome. Um, is that right? Something like this. Um, and basically we're gonna grab a time and we're, we're gonna wait until that time is complete. Um, actually, there's another, there's another one here. We can use delay. Um, and delays, delays a function, I think it, add, it was added in 1.0.2. Um, and it just wraps a metronome. Um, but it allows you to um, kind of basically just take a function and say, execute this at some point in the future. So we can do like recursive stuff with that. Um, and I think that's probably how we're going to build this whole system. So um, we're going to need our uh, delay function. Um, and we're also going to need to figure out how to like match on this idea of restart. Um, but we'll get there in a second. So the first thing when we timeline start is we want to execute the first step. I'm just going to say that seems like a, a, a good way to begin. Um, so let's do that. I'm going to, I'm figuring this out as we go along. So it's more of an exploration than a, than a lesson. Um, so let's say begin. And what we're going to do with that is, um, oh, I guess be, that zero, we might not have a zero at the beginning. So, but uh, we'll keep it simple for now. Um, so to begin, we want to look at the first element in the timeline. And what that's going to return to us is this subtable. So it's going to be a table of a time and an action. Um, so let's call it time step. Um, that's going to grab our first thing. And then what we want to do is use the function first. So we're going to say time step. Two. So the reason we're using two is basically it's the second item in the table, the first item being the time. We could give them names, but again, like that'll come later. Um, and we're just going to execute that function. So let's test that. Let's see if we get that first step happening. Now, to me, that should have played, uh, it should have executed this. So let's add a print in here just to see if it's going to, um, see if we're working. I feel like it's not. Cool. Attempt to call a nil value in timeline start. Okay, so what I'm doing is trying to figure out where this nil value is happening. Um, so I'm printing time step, which shows us that we do indeed have um, two things in here. Uh, it seems like time step two, it doesn't like though. So let's see what that, what this does here. Um, 
Right, so we're getting a nil there. Oh, and the reason for this is um This makes sense now. So this table up here, which is our which is our timeline, um, it's relying on these functions, f one, two, three, and four. And the problem is where we're declaring this timeline um, before those functions have been created. Yeah, so let's grab this table. And we can do two things. We can just put it down here below everything, or perhaps it makes more sense to actually define it inside of time, inside of init. Uh, maybe. Let's just put it at the bottom. Um, again, this is stuff that we can probably get around if we turn it into a library, but for now, let's like leave it like this. Um, so let's try that again. Let's see what happens now. Okay, cool. So we have a table and we have a function, which suggests that uh, this is correct. Let's try and call it. Okay, so we have our first step. Get rid of the, um, the debugging stuff. Okay, so we've used the second value out of our table. So now we want to use the first one to kind of queue up a change in the future. Um, so I believe the function is just delay. Um, and then we... I don't know how this works. Let's just try it. Let's say delay one second um, F1. Or F1. Okay, so that was wrong apparently. Uh, it's probably F1 for one second. There we go. So we've delayed the function, the call of the function F1 by a second. Um, so let's say in here we want to call what do we want to call? That's the question. Um, the, we want to call it in time step one seconds. So you'll see down here, like basically this is, oh, quite the opposite. Oh, we want to, what we want to do. Uh, so what that would do is that would say delay for zero seconds and then call the next thing. But what we're interested in, in this case, is the difference, basically the, the, the time step between these two values. Um, so we could do a, a duration thing, um, so that's easier. And what we do with that is we'd take the next time step. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this up here. Instead of being time step equals that, let's just write that in line. So that's exactly the same as what it was. Um, so that's saying for the first element of the timeline, grab the second value. So down here, we're going to say for the second element of the table, grab the first value. So this is um, function of um, stamp one, and this is time of stamp two. Stamp being the, the timestamp or like the, the line. It doesn't really make sense, but it's fine for now. The question is, what do we want to do when that happens? We could call the function of the timeline table directly, but that would kind of leave us having to kind of thread everything through inside of F2. Um, so what we want to do is we actually want to call a new function um, to kind of handle the sequencing through the timeline. So it's probably going to look very similar to timeline start, and we might even combine it with timeline start at some point. But for now, let's say timeline step. And that means after this delay, we're going to call timeline step. And let's just print just to prove that this is going to work. So there we go. You see it executed F1, and then you saw step one second later. Yeah. So that's good. That means we've kind of done our first item and now we're onto the second one. Um, that's cool. The problem is we're going to step forward and this next number is going to be a bit of a problem. But let's, let's persevere without worrying about that too much to start with. So once we're in the next step, we basically need to do the same thing. We have to execute the new 
um, the new timestamps function. So if we hard coded it, we would be like, oh, we've moved on to the second element of the timeline. And again, we need the second element, which is the function. So we could do, we could call that. So let's try that. There we go. Okay, so we have the first set of notes and the second set. Um, yeah. That's great. So how do we sequence this though? Like it kind of, if we're gonna have to make an extra function for every time, um, it's, we're gonna basically get into a position where we'd have as many things managing our timeline as we do actually doing the stuff. So why would we even bother? So we're gonna try and figure out a way to make it kind of um, static. That's not the right word. I don't know. It's we're gonna try and make it a, a like kind of programmatically step through. So the way I want to do this is I'm gonna make a new variable, which is let's call it line, and this is gonna basically be which line of the timeline we're executing. So we're gonna start at number one. And the cool thing is that means I believe we can just change this timeline start to use the line. And then, so we're back in the, the first item. Before we call this delay, what we actually wanna do is increment that line value. So line equals line plus one. And what that means is we can now call this line again. So this, this value of line has has incremented since this one. So we don't have to worry about which one comes first. It's just saying like, call the action, increment to the next line, and then um, wait for the amount of time um, that's listed. So again, down here, we can change this to be line again. Um, so this is gonna, basically this line 14 looks identical to line seven. Um, and this should still run. And it does. Now again, we need to increment the line. And we need to delay to call that same function. And I think I'm just copying this from the start function, but I think it's going to be exactly the same. Okay. So it's stepping through everything and now, then we get an error. And this makes sense because what's happening and it's gonna keep happening. And this is because we've gotten to the end of the table, we've gotten here and we've we've lost the ability to, to move to the next step um, because there's nothing at the end to kind of handle the terminate the terminating position. Um, the other issue we have here is that these time values, they're being treated as durations rather than timestamps. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do this, but I wanna treat them as timestamps. So um, I'm just gonna do it the most naive way, which is to say, I'm gonna take at each step the value that it's meant, like the time it's meant to occur at, and I'm going to um, take that value and subtract the immediately preceding stage. Stage, numbers, uh, stage number one is going to be different because there is no preceding stage. Um, but let's let's allow these two these two side by side functions, which are identical at the moment. Let's keep them for now um, so that we don't have to worry about that edge case um, all at once. Um, so, oh, actually, maybe it doesn't even matter. Um, let's say local um, duration, dur for short, is going to be what we have here. So this is our absolute duration um, and we want to subtract the previous duration and so we could actually do that by doing this twice right we can't declare it local twice but um the first thing we're going to do is in the current stage in the start stage we're going to grab 
the time value of the current stage, which is still line number one. And then we're going to step to the next line in the timeline. And we're going to grab that. Uh, now we're gonna grab that value, which is this here. So this, this TL line one is different from this TL line one. It's the next line down's timeline. And all we're gonna do is subtract the previous duration. And then hopefully, plug dur in here and what I'm seeing when I when I look at this if I clean up a little bit um, and just for a second imagine this line and this line aren't here I believe that makes both of these functions identical so I'm, for now, I'm just going to re. I'm going to change this. I'm going to make timeline start call timeline start again, which means this uh, this never gets called. So we'll just comment to that. There we go. Okay, we haven't handled our terminate terminus yet, but we now have the timestamps being called in an absolute sense. Um, there's probably going to be some drift and stuff in this particular uh, iteration, but I feel like that's kind of a little bit uh, elementary for now. Um, but we have this idea, and so let's get rid of this timeline step, and instead we'll let's rename this to be step. I'm just going to say uh, down here step. It's always going to start at step at line one. Okay, so now we have something. What we need to handle is this uh, this termination. And so the reason I've done it this way and, and hard-coded um, an ending is that if we didn't have a time here, we wouldn't know when to, to kind of begin again. Or maybe we, maybe we wouldn't want to ever begin again. We could say, if there is no next line, um, then just stop the sequence. We could add that right now. Um, so up here, uh, we can say if TL line, uh, if not TL line, then return. What this line's going to do is basically um, stop the timeline if we run out of lines in our in our, um, in our timeline. So let's try that and see if it stops. Okay, that looks great. It looks like it hasn't, it's not, uh, there's no errors now. Um, so we've successfully kind of stepped through a, bun a bunch of um, elements in here. Uh, we can make this a little bit more interesting. Let's add like another one, another call to F2. You could give like the idea is you would give these functions much more uh, descriptive names once they had once they had kind of um, more like clearer actions. Um, but so you hear there's like there's two notes in the middle there. Um, maybe not the most interesting, but uh, Yeah, so you can you can see how you can kind of resequence it. Um, this is nice, but what I want to do is I want to be able to make it like a, a loop, and I want to say at four seconds, I want to do a thing, and, and we could make it a function. So why don't we call it restart? This is maybe easier than matching it as a string. So let's just use restart as a new function, which is going to look just like one of these. Um, It's just a regular old function, and all it's going to do is set line to be number one. No, all it's, what it's going to do is it's going to set line to number one, and it's going to begin the stepping again. Cool. 
Okay, so I think we're running into an issue here where this function, this line, is um because it's a recursive call, it's basically calling this thing again inside of a metro. Um, I think what's happening is that metro is not being given time to kind of clean itself up. So what we can do is we can just like wait for a period of time here and then call the next thing. So let's make a function called wait and it's going to do nothing. Like there's, the body of the function should be right here but there's nothing in it so it's just going to it's going to do absolutely nothing. So we'll say wait and then after we're finished let's try and call timeline step recursively. The issue I think is that um, I can't do it like this because this delay, this delay line, uh, this is, what's the word, um, runs in parallel. Um, so basically this is going to execute immediately and just queue up uh, that, that action for the future, but it's not actually going to execute it right away. Um, I really... This should be the exact same as it was before. Seems like the stream has stopped. Stopping stream. 